Convention. This meeting was held in exciting Las Vegas, Nevada from July 9th through the 11th, 1999. SD to set up a firewall gateway. If you missed, uh, maybe like you were here sitting listening to me talk. Walls, gateways, and actually secured servers because you're dealing with like pretty much a lot of the same concepts by that point. Um, and the target uh, implementation is with NetBSD on the grounds that that's what I'm running, that's what I can field questions on, and um, it runs on a lot more platforms um, stably under one source base. So. You can't see it, but it's a work in progress. Um, <laughs> anyway, um, it's a work in progress, which means that um, things are still under development. I'm still working on scripts to automate things, still fi uh, fine tuning and getting uh, examples set up. And eventually, this will all be on a website so you can take a look at how this is all laid out and you can actually really easily um, see the example code, example uh, configuration. Yes, BSD is a, uh, I mean, it's, it's Berkeley derived code. Um, it is open source. It is underneath the Berkeley copyright, not the GNU uh, public license. And um, I actually prefer the Berkeley copyright versus the, uh, the GNU public license just due to the way uh, the GNU license is set up as far as getting other companies interested and, and so forth. Does that answer your question? Um, theoretically, a lot of the concepts are the same. How you go, might go about implementing it may or may not be the same. I'm not, when I say it's, it's targeting that BSD, that's because if you ask me about command line options and so forth, um, and you're running like Pico BSD or something, and Pico BSD doesn't have the dash QZZ option of some, uh, some command, I'm not going to know how to do the equivalent because I don't run Pico BSD. So that's why, I've, that's why the slides actually say NetBSD because that's the platform that I actually did this on. <coughs> no, this is, this is actually, actually, hold on. Let me see what I can do with you. Okay, uh, firewall versus gateway versus secure server. Um, basically, this is all depending on the purpose of the machine. Um, one of the key things you want to avoid is overloading it, the purpose of the machine. If you're putting a single machine out on the network, you don't necessarily want to um, have that one machine do everything. Uh, you basically want to isolate it by task, if at all possible. Um, and by the time you get down to a, a personal server trying to locate like four or five machines out on the net simultaneously, each doing their own function, um, may not be feasible. And actually some of the, the topics I cover uh, help isolate down multiple uh, functionalities on the same machine and protecting um, individual functionalities from with uh, each other. But generally you want to, to try to avoid overloading a particular machine such that if something gets compromised in one area, um, you lose the whole thing. 
Um, as you're building these machines, yeah, you can use uh, NetBSD for a firewall. Um, if you're a corporate entity, you've got to look at various threat levels and the cost versus the threat. If you've got a lot of information, we have a, need a lot of reputation capital um, that needs to be protected. You probably don't want to use any Unix-based um, firewall. You probably want to give Cisco a call and go out and buy a PIX. Um, basically because I mean, that's that's all it does. It protects your machine. It's it's a firewall. It's dedicated. Um, and if you're a major corporation, you may want to go go that route. Um, it's all based on cost versus uh, threat models. <laughs> basically, um, the, most people think of firewalls as you're, you're out there protecting some machine or some service on the inside from attacks on the, uh, the outside. So you're expecting people um, on one side coming in and attacking on the, uh, the inside. And there's no whiteboard. Um, in order for people to, to actually get work done when you've got a firewall in place, um, you've got to allow various services to be able to pass through that. Um, if you don't, people are going to attempt to find ways around the firewall and open up other security uh, holes, which basically undoes your, your carefully laid plans. Um, users are very uh, tenacious when it comes to what they want to do. Um, so especially in a corporate environment, you've got to have mechanisms in place to, to ensure that what you're doing and what you're blocking and what you're allowing is what the users want, need. Um, there's times when, yes, users may want a particular thing, but you have to say no. Uh, you need to have a corporate policy in effect that says you can say no, otherwise you're going to try to go around it and there's nothing you can really do. Basically, you've got this, this machine sitting in between two networks, and um, there's at times where you need to allow the inside to get out into the open uh, area, and sometimes you need the outside to have the ability to get in. Um, if you've got your personal machines firewalled off on, on the internet, it works really good when you're at home sitting right in front of it. Um, but when you go out um, and you're roaming, you've got your laptop and you've got your ricochet or other uh, wireless or remote connectivity means, and you suddenly realize that you've left a phone number at home and it's sitting on your machine at home, you tend to really, really want to be able to log into your home machine and get at that number. Um, so there are mechanisms to allow you to get back into your machine behind the firewall securely. A lot of times, um, if you've got multiple machines on the inside, you may want to set up uh, proxy servers. Most common is, is the web uh, proxies. Uh, this also helps with, with caching and so forth. And a lot of times, um, most corporations will locate this on separate machines uh, to not bog down the actual firewall machine itself. As, as home users, you can like consolidate it, this into, into one machine. and. Um, especially in the case of home users, unless you've got nice fast cable modems, you may want that caching if you've got a lot of people on the inside hitting that, uh, that same, same site. Uh, there's a couple different levels that uh, we're going to, to talk about as far as dealing with uh, what you're firewalling. <laughs> Some, some routing you can do to help you protect against firewalls. I mean, protect your, your internal network through the firewall. You can have your firewall routing different packets into different networks and ensuring that that traffic goes to its destination. Um, filters, you can start protecting things at the, uh, at the IP level, not allowing certain traffic to go to certain machines on the inside, but allowing the rest of the traffic to go to, um, to other machines. And this basically cuts down on, on the number of uh, attacks people can, can hit on those machines. And in the case of uh, small corporations, um, small offices, it will help prevent individual users from starting to run their own programs on their own machines that allow access in, into your network. Um, like 
common thing is for people to run like remote access servers on their machine, uh, not tell anyone in the IS department, just so they can, can log in from home. Uh, same thing applies to, to people setting up modems on their, uh, their personal workstations to allow people to dial in that immediately bypasses any firewall you can put up and uh, that's, that's really dangerous because it doesn't take much now for a user to set something like that up. It's a few mouse clicks under Windows and suddenly anybody can dial into that workstation and have access to your, your internal network and a firewall will do absolutely nothing to protect that. Um, you can actually have TCP wrappers to um, to watch what's going on and and determine um, what's connecting to to what service. Um, NetBSD actually has has TCP, TCP wrappers built in, so it's something that comes with the the OS um, as far as filtering. IP filtering is uh, built in and ships with the OS, so it's like right there, out of the box. You can start writing. Uh, writing rule sets and so forth to actually uh, to deal with that and you don't have to worry about downloading additional software. It's all right on the box uh, from the beginning. Um, by writing uh, we write uh, rule sets you can, you can really cut down on, on like the number of t attacks. Um, scanners, it is actually possible to, to go out and get software that will look at TCP streams coming in and analyze them for certain textual sequences. Um, a lot of times they will look for the uh, string root kit and set off all sorts of alarms and kill the connection. So basically if it sees like tar xf root kit, it's like, wait a minute, something's wrong here. Someone's unpacking a root kit from a remote site on an internal machine, um, kill off this connection, log the, uh, the attempt, and, and notify someone. And so you, you can act, there's actually software out there that will do real-time analysis of the streams going through uh, a machine. Um, personally, I'm, I'm opposed to that just due to, to privacy considerations. And if you're running SSH like you all should be, um, your streams going through your firewall are encrypted anyway. So running that sort of scanner is not going to work. <coughs> Logging is also very important because we can collect and look at and have available at our fingertips all the data that's going through the machine constantly, but if we don't do anything with it, if we don't do the correct things with it, it's absolutely useless. So the um, key point is if you log to the machine itself, if it ever gets compromised, people can mess with the logs. So what you want to do is set up another machine internally highly locked down, that is basically a log server. The only thing it does is it takes um, syslog messages and writes them to disk. Um, I've actually seen, seen cases where they've gone to the extreme since you know, syslog is UDP based and doesn't require an ACK, they've actually taken um, machines that are plugged into the network via the AUI connectors, the old star connectors, and have cut off the transmit pin from the machine. So the machine could not possibly talk back to the network. So the only thing that can happen is that machine can receive UDP packets. There is no way to really break into a machine like that. Because the only thing you can fire at it is UDP. You're never going to get a TCP connection. You're never going to get a response back. Um, and so you, you're really, really limiting what can be done. The worst case in that is someone can, can attempt to try to fill up the, uh, the log disk on that machine and then try more malicious attacks. Um, but disk space is very, very cheap. Uh, you can go out and get 10 plus gigs for under 200 bucks. Um, so trying to fill up that much space before someone notices is very, very difficult. But the, the main point is logging is very important. And it's routing. Um, a 
lot of sites will only need to set up uh, static tables as far as the, the routing of their internal network. Um, most people will only have one connection to the outside world, and so static tables are fine. Um, if you're on a larger corporate style network, we may have multiple paths to, to the outside world. Maybe running dynamic uh, routing protocols, and one of the key things you got to watch for is um, various poisonings of your, your routing tables. Um, at home, actually had a little bit of a problem in uh, Fremont uh, a few months back when a user broadcast a VGP packet um, out to to the routers that basically told them to get to anywhere in the world, you go to that machine. Um, this pretty much shut down Fremont. Um, network address translation, NAT, um, is very common amongst uh, home users and small offices, basically turning a single IP address or a, a small handful of IP addresses that were given to you by your service provider into a fairly large, large pool. Um, at, uh, in my bedroom, I've got probably eight or nine machines. Um, my network connection, they have given me one IP address. And it, it's working just fine for me. I had no problems with it. Um, works great. And you can actually deal with uh, real sets. And I'm so dead by the end of this. <laughs> Yes. It's a little bit more difficult, but um, I mean, a lot of the, the cache poisonings I've seen, it's it's theoretically possible on, on a single single pipe pipe out. Um, it's actually, it probably was I don't know what what set of slides they actually used used earlier, but I've I've worked with uh, both Pete and uh, and Punkus on, on presentations before, and I've seen a lot of those slides, and um, it's yeah, it's possible with a single single pipe. Not really, because you're, uh, with with NAT, you're only changing a, a few bits, and you're you're doing some uh, um, checksum uh, recalculation at one level higher. But you're doing a lot of that uh, that calculations and, and twiddling of bits at the uh, next layer down, anyway, because you're you're changing. Uh, um, you have got well, you got to drop it out on the wire on the Ethernet, so you're you're writing a new new MAC address into it. So you're, you're changing fields anyway. Um, so it's not going to, yeah, it, it's work to be done. So yes, it's going to add a load. But it's not, not all that, that significant. Um, I've seen 486s doing IPsec that are saturating 10 megabit links. So um, but granted, that was like single does. But um, you can't buy a 486 anymore. So anything, else, anything you're going to find now you shouldn't have any problem even when you start trying to do like IPsec and encrypting everything. <coughs> IP filters. Um, this is this is the core of, of what you, what you need to do to, in order to protect a machine. Um, you've got to have a, a really good set of, of filter rules to to make sure that what's getting through is what you want to get through. Um, Basically, if you've got a, a set of IP filter rules in the, the file that contains those rules, about half of those lines should be rules. The other half of those lines should be textual comments as to exactly what you're trying to accomplish with those rules. Um, I've seen, seen instances in corporations where people have in, in different departments have requested IS, oh, well, I need this port open. And IS has gone in and, and opened the port. And the, the need 
for that port being open dies off after several months. IS is never notified that that port is no longer needed open, but IS didn't document who requested the port to be opened, why it's uh, open. So it gets left in there for basically all eternity until someone sits down, says, okay, fresh start, we're gonna lock everything out and wait for people to complain. Um, this, this usually gets IS into a lot of hot water in, I'd say, 99% of the companies because a lot of times those security groups just don't have the political power within the organization to be able to stand up to marketing. The company is driven by marketing and um, a lot of times they can, oh, well, we need this and um, management will say, okay, well, you guys make this happen, allow them to do this. And there's not, a lot of companies just can't stand up to that. But your IP filter rules are, are really important in, in what, what you're protecting and how you protect it. So you really have to, to use those to, to lock down uh, your system. Basically, the, the rule of thumb is deny everything and then only allow th through what you want to allow through. Um, there's a lot of rule sets out there that are attempting to like block certain ports. Um, if you know what you're doing, you can get away with uh, just blocking certain ports. Um, however, the, the safest bet is to deny everything, pass through what you want passed through. <laughs> like I said, um, actually accidentally jumped ahead of uh, the slide there. Like I said, comment what is allowed, when, by whom, and any authority that, that said this has to happen. Um, an additional point is note that if that rule is ever to expire, that is if we need this port open from now until next February, note that, that it can be closed off next February. That way you don't end up with this huge file with all sorts of ports open and nobody knows how long it's supposed to be open. You can go back and, and deal with uh, cleaning up your rule sets. Um, you also want to make sure that when you're opening up a port, you find out what that port needs to go, what machine it needs to go to. So you don't want to open up a port to, on all the machines going through because that can be used to attack other machines that may not be running that server or maybe having other resources and other types of uh, servers running at that port address, um, which can then uh, be attacked because one group needed a port open for only their servers, but it was opened up for everybody's. TCP wrappers um, basically allow you to deal with uh, monitoring who's connecting to what and dealing with services um, and, and basically give you a little another layer of, of denying control. This is at the, uh, the next layer up. Basically, you're trying to establish a connection rather than just looking at the, uh, the raw packets. Um, this gives you better control over like application-based based security and, and wording things. Um, whether you write, write rule sets and deal with rules at a TCP wrapper layer, just logging what's happening versus blocking ports, it's up to your particular implementation and, and what you feel more comfortable with. Um, yeah, that would be one, one way of, of putting it because it's um, assuming that all your, well, at least under the BSD kernel, all your, your routing and your, your filter rules are happening in user land. It may, I mean, sorry, in kernel space and other implementations, some of those packets may be popping up into, into user land. If you know you can, you can deny connections, um, you want to like get them, those packets out of the mix as soon as possible. It's less work for your, um, your higher up layers if you can just eliminate them as soon as you know you can eliminate them. <coughs> as we got um, scanners looking for, for bad things happening, a um, couple, couple products I want to mention that's, that's out there. Port Sentry, um, was, which was formerly uh, Abacus Sentry, you can set this up to, to start watching people trying to connect. This is working off of your, your IP filter uh, logs. So if you don't have services running on uh, 65,531 of your ports, um, 
but you have services running on, on just those last remaining four, um, you're going to want to be able to detect if someone's trying to scan you. Uh, you don't want to wait until they stumble across those four uh, ports that you actually have something bound to. You want to uh, see that, hey, someone's trying to, to pass. Uh, pass packets on, on all these other ports and trying to find out what's open. Uh, so software like uh, Port Sentry will, will help you determine what's going on. Um, Tripwire is actually software that tends to run on the machine uh, itself. It allow you to, to determine if, if the machine has been compromised by, by doing checksums of the binaries, looking for things that have been uh, replaced, trojaned, etc. Content scanning, like I mentioned earlier, you're looking at the individual streams, looking for people t uh, typing suspicious or malicious uh, content through the wire. Usually these things are fairly flexible in setting that up so you can determine what exactly you want to look for. And it's not limited to just interactive uh, like telnet sessions. You can scan basically pretty much any uh, IP stream looking for this uh, potentially bad content. Logging, like I mentioned, the best uh, logging uh, is a, a, both remote and secure. You want to be able to protect that logging machine because generally you're not going to set up a logging machine for every machine you want to try, attempt to log to. So you're going to be uh, coalescing a lot of your logging functions onto one machine. So you want to make sure that that machine is, is really, really secure. I've got a machine called SD. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, you can actually tell tell Syslog to log to a remote machine, and that's um, that's a capability built in. There is uh, secure versions of Syslog out there that, that add additional layers of. So someone else does manage to compromise an internal machine. They can. Um, and they attempt to set up a, a, a sniffer or something. They can uh, they can block out uh, uh, there. We go. Looks a little strange to be jumping that far ahead. Um, providing services. So you've got machines out there that need to do something. Aside from just having your, your firewall to keep protecting your network, you do need to have machines that need to talk to the internet uh, as a whole. Um, web servers, mail servers, FTP servers, etc. Um, so in order for, for any site to be useful, you've got to be able to, to offer services and you've got to do something to be able to protect them. Um, Web is basically broken down into, into two categories. The web service itself, where um, people browsing the web will connect and, and get, get pages down. And the other half of that is content management. You've got to be, have some way of dealing with the web content that's there. And a lot of times you want to break this off into, into two categories as far as how you want to, to lock down the, uh, the permissions. Um, interactive. Uh, um, traffic is is a hard one to nail down because you're opening up the system to allow people to log into it. And one of the reasons you may want to do this is for, for content uh, management of um, like a web server or an FTP server so that people can update it and and keep it keep it fresh, deal with uh, content and other uh, logs there. Um, the other thing that people may need to have a direct account on the machine is for then hopping out either from inside the firewall onto the firewall and then out to the outside world, or in some instances you may need to allow people in through the firewall. So being able to access resources both on the outside and on the inside of the, uh, the firewall you may need some sort of an interactive uh, capability. <laughs> Administrative considerations. Basically, you've got this machine there. Um, it's going to require some administration to, to deal with it. Uh, you need to be able to, to protect the, 
the access that's required to actually administer the machine. Uh, since administration requires additional privileges, you've got to be a lot more careful about how people who are doing administration of the machine are going to do it. Um, if you've got a, a large machine or a lot of machines, what you would need to do is decide on, um, if, with multiple administrators, decide on who is going to be doing what and what they're actually going to need to do in order to get their job done. Uh, one thing you want to avoid in, in a corporate environment is role-oriented uh, or role-based accounts. Basically, a, an account called like web admin. Um, if you have like one account with us called web admin and you've got five web administrators, you really don't want to have all of them trying to log into this one account with one password because now you've got five people with one password to one account. Um, if any individual writes it down on a post-it note, loses his day runner with it in it, um, it's harder to track how that password got compromised and there's also no accounting of who did what. Um, if someone decides they wanted to reorganize the entire, entire website, there's no no trail saying, oh well, this person came in as administrator, changed all these directories around. Um, if you've got um, if you've got an administrator who has like multiple duties and you've got and you've decided that he needs multiple access on on both like web and FTP, but you've got other administrators who only need web, only need uh, FTP. One uh, solution is to provide them with their own web administrator account, and then with another web, I mean another FTP administrator account. So the admin who has to manage multiple um, services would have multiple accounts, so that he is he knows that okay he is logging in to do this function, and it's a little bit. Um, more work for the administrator to deal with like the additional passwords, but at the same time he's not likely to accidentally do damage to another service area. So once you actually have all these accounts, one of the things that you're going to want to do is um, reduce the privileges down to what is absolutely needed to get the job done. Um, all these people who have their own accounts, those should not all be root equivalent accounts. That defeats the purpose. Um, this is a little harder in, in Unix-based systems than in systems that have like um, B2 uh, level security, where you actually have a capabilities-based uh, permissions model, where you don't have a root account other than an account called root that just happens to be by default assigned all priorities. Uh, some of those higher end systems have, have neat accounts like backup, which basically gives read access to all files, write access to tape drives, and that's it. They can't change or modify or create any file they want. They can read anything. They can write to a tape uh, drive, and actually they can read from the tape drive and, and write to a restore area, and that's it. Um, unfortunately, this hasn't gotten popular amongst uh, even most of the commercial Unixes, um, and it hasn't hit hit the free OSs yet. Uh, it's, it is something I would like to see because it would vastly improve security because you can really lock down who can do what. Um, another thing that you're going to want to to pay attention to, and there's mechanisms to do this, is compromise protection. Um, where this is. A, uh, an era where we've got a lot of free software out there, and at, by that uh, same token, we can't always guarantee the code quality, so any given version of Apache may have a bug that allows you to, to compromise the uh, route onto the system. SendMail is notorious for having this problem where you can, you can break SendMail and, and get root access. And the problem is, once you've got root access through SendMail, in most installations, you now have root access over the entire machine. 
So as you're reducing your privileges, you have to, uh, to understand that the defaults may be way too open as far as what permissions are set on what directories and um, how things are set up. This is done a lot of times because a lot of the newer users are expecting to be able to do things easily with their own accounts. So rather than, than really securing a, a system and getting tons of email from new users saying, well, it won't let me do this, I've actually seen instances where people, where various OS camps have opened up the security on uh, the OS just to stop getting email saying, well, it won't let me do this. Um, unfortunately, that's it's not the, uh, the best route. The best route would have to, been to educate the users and provide more upfront information saying, hey, you got to do this and this first. <coughs> so the really big things that we're going to need compromise our protection are, are web and uh, your mailers. Um, FTP. Occasionally has had had some problems, but it's it's not as not as much. You still want to attempt to do some compromise protection for for web and send mail. So how do we do this? There's a wonderful wonderful system called called chroot, and with it we can change what the system will allow the root of a, of the directory tree to be. So basically we've got four, five key areas here. We've got user space, basically areas of, uh, of the uh, directory tree that users need to be able to access or uh, various applications need to be able to access to do their job. We've got uh, things in slash dev that uh, allow things to communicate uh, within and out of the system. We've got shared files, which are basically files that are needed by more than one service, such as if you're providing web, um, you need, the web server needs to be able to access the files, so does the people who are administrating the content. Um, VAR is needed in a lot of uh, instances because like you've got uh, your mailers who are uh, pulling mail in, they want to be able to, to write to, to VAR, and at the same time you've got people who are reading mail who also want to, to see the same VAR spool that the mailer sees so they can actually pick up their mail. So a neat way of getting users into, uh, into these ch-rooted cages is by starting up SSH in its own ch-rooted area. This will allow any user who logs in via that particular SSH daemon to end up in the ch-rooted cage, um, which is then very carefully built to only put into that cage what is necessary for them to do what they need to do. <laughs> to get things into uh, these ch-rooted cages, especially like in the uh, the, uh, the shared areas. Our goal is to protect the, the outside from being able to, to access it. So we've got to take care to deal with permissions, both uh, the user IDs and the group IDs. Um, the way we get things into these cages is your actual disk, undisk storage lives in another portion of your directory tree. What you'll do is make local mounts from that point in the file system into the ch rooted cage. Symlinks will not cross a ch root boundary, but if you mount something in, inside a ch rooted area, it will show up. By doing this, we can control exactly what any individual cage sees. Is there a question? And as we're mounting, oh, this is so not going to work. Um, as we're mounting uh, the, these files systems into these ch rooted cages, we can take advantage of a lot of mount uh, options, um, such as not being able to exec, not being able to um, make device nodes, not being able to run set UID binaries, uh, not being able to, to allow core dumps, and so forth. Basically, all your, your mount options, so you can really lock down what is possible um, in binary? If you're mounting your, your binary tree for users to execute certain uh, certain programs, you may want to mount that um, read only. 
so that if the, the cage does get compromised, they can't change any of the binaries. <laughs> CH root is actually a system call, so it's down at the kernel level, and basically it doesn't allow you to to traverse above a certain certain point. Wherever you CH root in into, you'll give it give CH root a arguments of a directory and then an executable. And the executable is relative to that directory. Any program that that is then uh, fork exec off of that. Um, its root, as far as the root file system is concerned, is the directory that you pass as that argument to ch root, and it just can't go any higher than that. And so it's, it's locked into that portion of the directory tree. So now we get to... Um, the PowerPoint slides will eventually be available as soon as I can convert them into a real format, and they will be available actually on uh, on this website. So, yeah, um, unfortunately, I, I got caught up with uh, my real job, and they uh, I spent like the past three weeks writing and then giving two courses on a particular API set that I wasn't planning on, and basically that that consumed like literally three solid weeks of, of my time, which I lost a lot, a lot of sleep over. <laughs> SDF1. Um, any anime uh, fans out there may recognize uh, SDF1. Um, so I, I actually have a machine named SDF1 that is sitting out um, on the net. And on it, I've got right now um, a web server that is managing uh, three domains. Um, and each one of those has content that is in varying degrees of completion. Um, and due to the fact that I can completely over overworked because work likes to just uh, hit me with, can you please design a course and teach it um, next week. I've, I've gotten a couple of friends, or suckered a couple of friends, I hope they're not in here, um, to, to actually do content management uh, for a couple of those, those sites. So I then realized, okay, I've got to let these guys be able to log into this machine um, to be able to, to edit these web pages. My original plan was to create all the content on my machine at home and have a really simple uh, script that allowed me to SSH in with uh, RSA authenticated keys, so it's basically doing mutual authentication. Push the uh, push a new tar file of the entire web content up, and a script would run that moved the old content out of the way, dumped the new content in, and everything was happy with no user intervention, no user logging in, um, really limited ability. Unfortunately, I don't have that type of time, so I had to let them log in. And of course, they do not want to sit there the entire time. They do not want to sit there the, the entire time and use VI to create the content. They want to be able to do the create this content um, in the comfort of their own home. So I had to provide them a way with getting the content up to the machine. And they're unfortunately all on Windows machines, which doesn't have a nice, neat, uh, secure copy uh, interface installed. So I had to provide them with FTP. And the last thing I wanted was them typing in their passwords to FTP. So, okay, anonymous FTP only. And this was done to allow them to do content management. So the only writable areas are some hidden directories under incoming. So in order to accomplish all of this, I set up I cut several ch-rooted cages, one for the web, uh, one for users, one for FTP. And basically, inside the, the users area, when they SSH in, they SSH in, they end up in a ch-rooted uh, cage. 
and mounted in from another portion of the tree is slash HTML, which is the web content. This exists on another portion of the disk. It's mounted into to that area so they can go ahead and access it. Uh, the FTP, which is sitting off in its own CH-rooted cage, um, the directory that's, that they're FTPing into, that is mounted from that CH-rooted cage into the user's CH-rooted cage so they can access it. Since I've got to administrate the machine, I've got another SSH running at another port, so that will, will let me log in and actually get to the real root, so I can really log in and, and deal with the administration of all of this. Um, with that, I can control and set up these various CH-rooted cages. But the fact that I've got two SSHs going now, um, two SSHDs going now, I just have to start worrying about dev entries because the way dev permissions are restored is they're uh, set back to, uh, to 666 for some bizarre reason. Unfortunately, there is not one place that I can go in and tweak the code to say set the mode to zero when uh, you deallocate a, a TTY, PTY pair. It seems that every single daemon does this itself. I looked through the SSH code and saw where it did it there. I looked through Telnet and saw where it did it there. I looked through Login and saw that it did it there and went, this is not good. This means that I've got to make changes to several daemons every single time I want to upgrade to make sure that the uh, TTY permissions are reset correctly so that as I'm going along and people are logging in and out, that as I log in as, as root um, in one domain, that someone logging in as a, as a user in that ch rooted cage and sees the, the dev entries there um, can't mess with them. So having multiple device nodes was not going to work because of these permissions. So what I ended up doing is creating a subdirectory under slash dev that only had uh, hard links from it into the uh, TTY, PTY pairs, hard link into standard in, standard out, standard error, um, dev zero, dev null, and dev random. And then mounted this the subdirectory, which had a very limited set of dev entries, into the ch rooted users uh, directory. This allowed the, the ch rooted users cage to have access to the dev entries that it needed, but not all the dev entries. So even if someone was able to, to get root in there, they weren't able to, to make the dev entries to create um, dev entries for the hard disk. And basically, I mount, you can mount those, uh, the file systems in with the, with the appropriate permissions bit set so people cannot, uh, cannot deal with uh, creating new dev entries in the slash dev, mount all the other file systems no dev so they can't create dev entries anywhere else. And you can really lock the system down and prevent people from, from making changes even if root is compromised. Um, for situations like FTP, um, I don't remember exactly what version of FTP I've actually got running, um, but it's most of the shell code out there for FTP exploits assumes you have a bin sh. There's no bin sh in that ch-rooted cage. You're not going to be able to exec it. It just won't work. Um, the only thing that lives in that directory is the FTP D binary itself. Um, so unless you want to write an entire shell in shell code, um, even if you can find the buffer overflow in that version of the FTPD, it's not going to do you much good. And even if you are able to break root right through FTPD, you now have access to the FTP files. And if I'm serving any FTP out, well, you're not going to be able to compromise those because those have been mounted read-only into that CH-rooted area. So the capabilities that you're left with after compromising root are really, really limited because of this extra efforts uh, set up to create
create these particular cages and lock, um, what resources are available down to only what is needed for that service. And the same things can be done for, for send mail, for your pop, any other uh, internet related services that you need. You just duplicate these CH rooted cages on out and only provide binaries that are they're absolutely needed. In fact, um, I haven't had actually any of my users complain yet, but they can't even do a who to find out who's on the system because who doesn't exist um, in that CH rooted cage. And even if who did exist, there's no dev KMAN. So even if they copy in a who binary, um, it's not going to do them any good because it's just not going to work. And, and by those tokens, um, you can really, really keep, keep people out of what you don't want them to do. And if you ever do need to administrate the machine, you've got an entirely different port set up where you can log in as, as an administrator and, and do the things that you need. And if we flip back real quick to those IP filtering rules, since you've got a different port lot, uh, for administrator, you can control from what sites someone can log into that port. So basically you can say, I can allow users into the user CH root cage from anywhere uh, because I have no control as to where my friends may actually want to log in from. Or I can limit, limit them to logging in from machines I know they have accounts on. But for logging in uh, in that uh, the real root of the, the directory tree, I know that I really only want people to get in from um, my disorg account, my remark.org account, and, and maybe my DSL address. So I can lock it down to, to those three systems and prevent, prevent people from, from getting in. Or I can just leave it as, well, if we want to administrate the machine, use console and just not allow any network access to the root of the tree, but at the same time we still have people able to log in to do work. <coughs> As I mentioned, we can uh, scan for, for activity of, uh, of malicious users attempting to do things, even if they have an account. Um, there's a lot of ways you can you can detect this. You've got scanners um, locking down what, what executables they can actually run. Um, this kind of reeks of, of Big Brother, so I'm really, really hesitant to actually even endorse this. Um, if you're working for a, a corporation that has a, a very well-written security policy saying this is what you're allowed to do, this is what you're not allowed to do, and if you do something you're not allowed to do, you're fired. Um, you might be able to be, have a better chance of getting away of scanning uh, the interactive traffic to, to find out what people are doing and logging, shutting down connections as appropriate. Um, other neat feature I've seen in, the, uh, in a B-level secure system is uh, the kernel keeps track of what network interfaces you're talking to. And if you attempt to, to bind to more than one network interface, can detect this and kill off that process and then log who, what, and when attempted this violation. So basically, if you've got a system that's a firewall and basically you're authorized to log into that uh, internally to manage some content, um, you're coming in from an internal address. You can go in and say, OK, I can log in. I can do my work. But you wouldn't be able to set up a daemon that listens on both the internal and the external to allow it to pass any sort of traffic. So you'd always have to do this. If you're trying to, to move any content in and out, you'd have to do a, a, a sort of a bounce. Move the content onto the machine, then move the content uh, off, and you've got better control over what's going on by, by adding that additional restriction. Um, other things that may want that could be uh, done in the future that just aren't really set up uh, smoothly right now is additional login restrictions where you're controlling who can log in from where when. Um, 
basically uh, time-based, location-based logging in um, without filtering uh, at the, uh, the IP level. Basically, you say, okay, it's okay for, for Joe to log in from home after 5, but before 9 a.m., no problem, he works from home at that time, it's cool, but we don't want to let him log in remotely from um, 9 to 5. We want him to be here in the office doing his job. So that's, that's an additional uh, direction for the future. Any questions? Sorry. Initial stages of packaging this for general consumption. Um, the machine that I described, SDF1, is a, at, set up this way. It's been set up that way for um, quite some time now, and I haven't had too many user complaints. Uh, the only thing that has really come up is it would be really nice if we had Pico. So that's that's been like the only comment on that. Any other questions? So occasionally you, you enter a situation where your firewall just isn't enough. So you, you really have to take it to, to the, uh, the next level. This may be a little hard to see, but if you talk to John afterwards, um, that's a GE minigun. And That's a really cool drawing. <laughs> You'd probably be going back a bit if you actually if you actually fired that, but I'd like to see it. <laughs> I'd like to see the malicious user he was targeting too. So if you're interested in the shirt, back to John. Any other questions? How would you compare previous I would compare it as uh, Judaism, Hinduism, Christianity. <laughs> it's, 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 I mean, it, it gets down to, to a religious war. Um, I've had lots of luck with, uh, with NetBSD. Um, I've been running it since uh, probably 93, 94. I probably still have 0 0.8 install floppies floating around, which is one of the first publicly consumable versions. Um, that was well before the, the OpenBSD split. Um, NetBSD runs on currently 16 different hardware architectures, so pretty much it's, it's almost, it's got a 32-bit CPU or greater and an MMU. You've got a good chance of it running or getting it running without too, too much work. Um, as far as FreeBSD, their, their goal used to be the best optimized uh, Free, BSD, free version of a, of a BSD for the Intel platform. Um, Linux, unfortunately, it's just it's just way too too diversified. Some of its strengths have really contributed to to some of its weaknesses. Um, yes, it's got a lot of a lot of drivers available for it because you've got a lot of people writing drivers for it. Unfortunately, you do have a lot of people dri writing drivers for it, and so the code quality may not be the uh, the same. Uh, across the board. Also, pardon? from a firewall standpoint, um, there's a lot of driver sharing between uh, like FreeBSD and, and NetBSD. Um, and I know OpenBSD is, is in there looking at the same code as well. Um, they're all BSD stack derived. Um, I don't know what Linux did to the BSD code when they moved it into into their kernel, but they've been having a lot of problems with it. Um, I know um, NFR was having having issues with uh, with running on on Linux because the stack just wasn't up to it going at full speed. So Linux may not be the best option uh, in light of that. Um, I haven't had a chance to to actually test that out, um, but that's something I have heard that there were issues with the, the Linux stack, so um, 
to each is his own, but that, that may be a potential issue. That sort of answer your question? Anybody else? Questions, comments, more beer? <laughs> Okay, uh, thank you. If you have any additional uh, questions or longer questions, feel free to come on up.